Danette, welcome to the For the Love of Sport podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Yeah, we are. We were thrilled that you uh, you agreed to to jump on, and and obviously we're gonna we're gonna dive into all the great work that you know the Women's Sports Foundation is doing, the work you know you and your team are doing. But before before we jump into that, we like to start with the hardest hitting question, um, mm. which is. Can you yep. perhaps tell us about your own personal youth sport experience? Uh, did you play sports growing up? What was that like? It's usually a very common bond between between all of our guests and, and people of of having some interaction with youth sports. So we'd love to we'd love to hear yours. Yes. So um, I have to say I have like a two prong youth sports um, story. Um, I played softball my entire youth. So I grew up. My father was a high school baseball coach and football coach. And um, he played baseball at UCLA. So I definitely was thrown on a baseball field very early on as his nice. kid. And um, he put a softball in my hand at a very young age. So I actually played softball until ninth grade. Um, and now that I'm the CEO of the Women's Sports Foundation, I like to remind myself that I am what the WSF calls a middle school dropout. Um, <laughs> what happens to a lot of girls our age, unfortunately, at the age of 14, we make a decision to stop playing sports. And I was one of those mm. girls. I can't tell you what my ninth grade brain was saying on why I made that decision. Um, looking back, one of my you know biggest moments that I'm definitely frustrated by that I didn't continue not saying that I would have gotten a division one scholarship somewhere to play softball. I doubt I was that good, but it um, definitely transformed my life as, as a child. And I know I wouldn't be the person that I am today or, or really honestly the executive that I am today, if it wasn't for playing a team sport and being a part of something that I think is really powerful for girls and women. And then I found that the second piece of my youth story is I found my, my sports again when I went to college and Although I, I didn't play at the that level at Arizona, I started playing intramural sports and I actually found girls flag football. And oh, it became, yes. I know yes. now it's kind of ironic <laughs> because um, I couldn't be more excited about the fact that flag is growing the way that it is and yeah. becoming, a, and it has just become a high school accredited sport in my state in California, mm -hmm. as it is around eight or 10 different sports. And I'm going to tell you, if they had girls flag football when I was a kid, that would have been the sport I played. <laughs> Me I too. Loved it. it was mm -hmm. probably one of my favorite sports I've ever played. I met my husband playing flag football. So I have softball and flag football in my life. Those are my two youth sports stories. I love that. Those are two yeah. really solid core youth sports just in general, because we've we've heard nothing but excitement about both. Like We've, we've seen the, the growth of softball. We've seen uh, the growth of especially – uh, youth flag football, especially across the, the boys and girls. And it's really, really fun to see, especially like culminating in like the pro bowl where you have like the pros playing flag football, but you're also bringing out like some youth programs too. I'm, you know, I, I love going backwards of just like, you know, what if, um, having it like knowing that you have flag football as such a, a startup and something that's gonna be really accessible for a lot of young female athletes. Are there other sports that, you've seen grow, especially in, uh, you know, for, for girls programs, like any other sports that are out there that have been like, that have made leaps and bounds since, uh, since you've, I guess, entered the professional world. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you have to say, I would say three primary sports have made big leaps. And I'll say the one right now that obviously is hotter than hot is women's basketball. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I had the good yeah. fortune of working in the sport for many years on the collegiate and on the pro side, as you know, for my bio and, um, seeing where, when, when I was working with the Sacramento Monarchs, which was an original franchise, there was only eight of us, very different than where we are today. And then even spending 12 years at the Pac-12 conference and where women's basketball was when I started to where it is today. Um, it is so refreshing to see um, where that sport has grown. Um, and we can talk a lot about that. We can talk about Sabrina and Steph and what that meant in the comparison mm. to the battle of I sexes with Billy and, and um, Bobby Riggs, but yeah. I would say women's volleyball has also grown tremendously. Yeah. Clearly women's soccer has on a global stage. Um, and what I think is interesting is there's a lot of sports that have a tendency to be very regionalized. I'm on the West coast. So mm -hmm. we have some very powerful water sports that, you know, may not be, or I would like to say beach volleyball. It may not be as popular in other parts of the country. <laughs> Um, it hasn't made its way up to Minnesota. No, and not I, yet. I, I keep, I keep checking, hockey. but it just, you, you know, have amazing ice hockey, like the professional hockey league is, True. you know, you, you talk about Minnesota, like 
how fast, I mean, that started in January and they're selling out their buildings. Yeah. So I think yeah. there is so much momentum in women's sports and so much opportunity for girls. We just need to make sure that those opportunities continue because unfortunately we've also gone backwards on access um, for mm -hmm. girls. And so we need to make sure that um, that grows at the same time we take advantage of the momentum that's behind it so that people recognize it's time to invest at all levels of women's sports. Youth and yeah. youth is being a big part of that as much as the elite side. Yeah, it's um, it has to be cool for you to be able to knowing your journey. You know, you've been a part of of women's sports uh, in some way, shape, or form throughout your whole career, and to be able to see it and now be at the place where we are, which is such an inflection point. I feel like like yeah. the sports that you mentioned have clearly taken off, and in you know. Simon and I would love to talk basketball. We both love basketball, I, I so that's say, definitely an angle we can into take. That actually, but go um, on. <laughs> but what what for you is you know the coolest part about you know your journey to now being the CEO of the Women's Sport Foundation? Like, what does that mean yeah. to you, having seen it, having kind of lived this whole journey? Like, th do you often reflect on that and just think about where you are now and how cool it is in, in a moment in time that you're into? Yeah, I think, you know, life is interesting how it brings together at different points of kind of your journey into a place where, honestly, this is like the culmination of everything that I've done and the passion that mm -hmm. I have for women's sports. You know, when I started, I didn't recognize very early on, you know, I, I was fighting the fight, I used to say, in my kind of WNBA days and early kind of women's sports days, even when you know, my very first kind of big women's sports job was when I was the executive director of the Women's Final Four in 1999. And that goes yeah. way back as we go into, um, you know, March Madness. And I was I had the pleasure of working at Stanford. Stanford was the host for, you know, and I was there for a couple of years. I was very young in my career. I had this amazing deputy athletics director that gave me this opportunity, a woman who that was very rare at the time that a number two of an athletics department was in that role. Um, I was in my twenties and that position was a catalyst in my career. And I look mm -hmm. back now and I think about that women's final four, it ended up being Purdue won that Carolyn Peck was the first African-American coach to ever win a national championship. Um, it was a huge success, but it was my first beginning of understanding how hard it was to sell sponsorships for women's sports, pushing a boulder mm -hmm. up a hill, then I had some more experiences after that, doing the same thing in Sacramento, then obviously the same at the collegiate level. So for me, being able to see this all come together, it's not just a, it's it's finally the tipping point. And for me to come to the Women's Sports Foundation, I realized that I've been spending my whole life putting this all together from a business perspective. But coming here, I started to recognize from an advocacy and a research and a community impact perspective that Billy was pretty amazing that 50 years ago, she realized we were needed to be founded. And we mm -hmm. were founded two years after the passing of Title IX. And I'm still shocked today how much fight and how much we have to yeah. continue to make sure that that legislation is protected, but also helping people understand how the whole ecosystem is connected. It's not a coincidence that we are where we are with Sabrina and Steph. It's not a coincidence yeah. we are where we are with Caitlin Clark. It's not a coincidence that we're here. It's because I'm the first generation Gen X that has lived playing sports our whole lives as a yeah. female. And wow. so it's all connected to the legislation, which is we are here to make sure that everybody understands the imperative nature of when girls and women play sports. It's life changing. It impacts our society. It impacts our economy. And so I'm the example of a 94% C-suite stat. Like I wouldn't have been an executive in the NBA, um, a C-suite in my roles before here, if it wasn't for me playing sports. I know that mm -hmm. because I know mm -hmm. what it taught me. And I always share that the best gift I ever got of playing sports is it taught me how to lose. And when you know how to lose, mm. you're so resilient. And every yeah. day I try to push that boulder up a hill, whether I'm fundraising, whether I'm doing something else, Knock me down 10 times out over. I'm going to get back up again. And I know that's because of sports. You answered yeah. like I had a, I had a question keyed <laughs> up from that. And you answered it like right there. Yes, I was gonna, I was, I'm not passionate <laughs> about this topic. So keep me going. Yeah. Okay. No, no, it's, not it's a chance. Wonderful. No, I, I don't want to cut you off because it's, it's amazing. Uh, and I, I, I really, your, your answer there was just the, the preemptive question I was going to ask you about just the transport transformative power of you sports and like the sort of lifelong lessons that come from playing. And like you said, it's the, 
being able to learn to lose in sort of that safe environment and understand, and then go from there and learning from those mistakes and then resiliency too. And then taking that, you know, on and off the field, uh, in different ways. And I, I also wanted to hover a little bit over what you said about a tipping point where I, I absolutely feel that we've, we've reached this point now where I was, uh, I was playing a, a rec league, uh, basketball game last night. Shout out to my buddy, Frank, who was wearing Sabrina ENSQ's like signature Nikes and they look great. And <laughs> that's the other thing is like, those are her pair. It's not just for girls or women. It's, it's now just like Nike's doubling down on it of, of that, where it's now a signature shoe across everyone and everyone can have access to that. And also they're comfy as hell. <laughs> My goodness. And just the, the, per, I don't want to go into a huge, like shoe dog conversation about it. Cause I'm a big fan of Nike, big fan of basketball shoes. We sh will, Troy will edit this out. Point is I love seeing the sort of impact that, you know, women's sports is having, and it's getting to be more of just like, this is now just the norm where like they're, you know, we, we, it's been, we have this establishment and now we continue to fight for it and continue to like provide exposure to it and promotion for it. But you can see it where you have Kel Caitlin Clark getting primetime uh, play on these major networks and it's, and it's well worth the time to watch her play. Cause it's just amazing. But I'm, I'm curious if you can, you know, I know you mentioned a couple of those, those benefits from, from playing sports and how that is, how that um, has uh, stayed with you throughout your professional career. Is there anything else beyond, you know, the losing in a safe environment and uh, yeah. the resiliency, any other values or lessons that you yourself have, have felt from the, the power of youth sports and, and the power to play sports and then how, and any, maybe any, any other examples that you've seen too, uh, firsthand. Yeah. I think everybody that has played sports can probably check the box on a lot of these different kind of areas, right? There's physical benefits, there's social, emotional benefits, there's academic and leadership benefits. Um, and I think, you know, because I'm so far into my career and it feels so long ago that I ever played those sports, the most common ones for me kind of fall in that leadership, in that leadership bucket, right? So we talk yeah. about resiliency, talk about time management skills, just being disciplined, knowing how to set priorities. Um, but I think some of the most important ones are the real basic ones. I always laugh. I played second base. Most of the time I had to have another player help me get an out and mm. just collaboration and teamwork. Yeah. Like that yeah. is one of the most yeah. critical assets that you learn in order to be able to be successful as a leader everywhere I've ever worked has been a team mentality. So once you kind of jump into managing people, it is all about what you learned about being a part of a team. And mm -hmm. it's like seems so basic and rudimentary, but you also are surrounded by people when you play on a team that really, you know, lift you up. You recognize the power of being lifted up. You recognize what it takes to be together. So there was nothing worse when you were the last out of a, you know, <laughs> the end of the inning and you struck out and the bases were loaded. That always was awful. But you yeah. had a team around you that realized, nope, we're in this together. Let's go. And that's kind of the same type of, I think for me, lessons that help have always helped me throughout my career. And I definitely recognize when I, became a vice president, you know, the first time I was a vice president was when I was with the Sacramento Kings. And I recognized pretty quickly, it was pretty lonely because I didn't see a lot of people that look like me. Um, mm -hmm. From a league perspective, I tell the story a lot. And these these women are still my besties to this day. But the league at the time, we, and they still do this today, they would, they would bring together kind of all the leaders of each of the departments of the teams as a part of these league meetings. And I remember walking into my first league meeting and I think I could count how many women on like maybe a hand and a half. And that was a little like intimidating and daunting because we were already working in professional men's sports. We were already like in a position where, you know, you weren't, you know, you're questioning yourself just because of the fact that that's what we do sometimes as women, because there's nobody else that looks like us in that room. And I can tell you today, that's a whole different ball game now in that room. That room is probably, probably close to 50, 50, I would like to think. But um, those kind of moments in my life, I would always go back to, it's all right, I can do this. And really also recognizing the importance of having male allies. And it's not just based on having, you know, you want women want to lift women up, but at the same time, you need male allies to do the same. Like, for the most part, outside of that one boss that I had at Stanford, all my other bosses were men. And they were mm -hmm. unbelievable mentors for me. And did nothing but support me and gave me the autonomy to have success. And they never looked at me for my gender. And that's something that I always really appreciated, especially being in the sports 
business and entertainment side because it was so lacking in, in women leadership when I was kind of growing up in it. Yeah, I do feel like that's such a crucial part that, you know, whether for better or worse, often isn't talked about of like there there is there is a period of time where there are a lot of right male leaders and they need to be the ones that are advocating and also pushing that forward. Um, so I, I resonate with that that sentiment for sure. Um, I do want to kind of maybe take us a little bit back because um, you had made a few notes of obviously Billie Jean King. Um, and mm -hmm. maybe for our listeners who aren't aware of just how the Women's Sports Foundation uh, came to be and, and, you know, why was it, you know, created 50 years ago? We're celebrating the 50th anniversary, which we'll definitely, you know, give you the chance to speak to, too. But maybe just for our listeners who um, unfortunately maybe aren't aware yet uh, of, <laughs> you know, your organization, maybe you could just talk us through really quick, like, how, how did this come to be? You know, obviously there was a need, Title IX, you know, saying the big one there, but um, why don't you go ahead and, and give our listeners a rundown of that. Yeah. So, um, so in 2024, May to be exact, like May 2nd is our actual anniversary date. Um, mm -hmm. Billie Jean had a $5,000 check and started the Women's Sports Foundation. Mm -hmm. And she did start it two years after the passing of Title IX, recognizing there was going to need to be an advocacy and research and community impact organization that was going to protect that legislation put out critical research and data to prove the model, to basically say, this is why it's important for girls and women to play sports. And then obviously all of the community impact work we do is essentially outputs of that research. And for 50 years, that's what we've been doing. We're one of the, you know, the first and the only, um, obviously now there's many organizations that are, you know, girls and women serving yeah. organizations, but we're still that primary one that is focused and has always been focused on the power of sport for girls and women. I have nothing but praise obviously for Billie Jean, but all of the women that came before me and before all of us currently the WSF to have a not-for-profit like ours live for 50 years is yeah. a remarkable accomplishment by yeah. itself. Um, you know, one of the stats I did not know until I came into philanthropy, which was two years ago and, you know, shame on me for not knowing it as a, you know, as somebody who, you know, wants to be a good philanthropist myself is, less than 2% of philanthropic giving goes to girls and women serving organizations. And there's mm -hmm. 55,000 of us, which we're one of. So we get mm -hmm. much like the crumbs on the business side of women's sports for so long. The philanthropy yeah. side is almost a hundred times worse. And that right there shows you the power of 50 years of this organization. But it's really important that people understand, like if you care about this part of, and you have the means or you have the ability to, amplify something somebody's work you know not-for-profits are really important and it's all on the people that want to support us but that stat bothers me but again my sports background i just look at that as okay so we Green can only grass. go up yeah. this is, yeah. fantastic. This is yeah. a competition here we go but um i think that says a lot so the 50 years we've been around is something that we're really proud of and over those 50 years we've been able to give back over a hundred million dollars. So that's a pretty powerful wow. number for us. And we do it through a significant amount of grant giving, as well mm -hmm. as making sure that the most up-to-date research and data is out there. I'll give you an example. This year we'll be launching two really big research projects. One is all around mental health and women's sports, which obviously mm -hmm. we know is a critical topic right now. That will be launching in May. And then we'll have another leadership um, research project that's all around the power of girls and women playing sports and leadership, kind of a generational look at it over the last 50 that will come out later in the year as well. So those are just two examples, but we really try to be that voice and that advocate. And we spent a lot of time, like we did last week, celebrating National Girls and Women's Sports Day and spending time with um, our politicians on the Hill, trying to make sure they understand the power of, of sport for girls. And I think that's something also that people don't realize. That was something that was co-founded by WSF 38 years ago. So it's been a, a really hard journey for 50 years, I think, for those that came before us. And it continues to be, I think, for a lot of girls, women serving organizations. But they're critical. We're all talking about youth sports right now. And we're talking yeah. about the momentum and the tipping point. And again, none of us would be here if it wasn't for that passing of that legislation and people fighting for it, like Billy. I, I, uh, I wanted to bring this up just cause I'm a big quote geek and I know that our listeners are not surprised by this or Marie, but, uh, being a big quote geek, I, I love 
Billie Jean King, especially when she said pressure is a privilege. It's just a nice little like thing to remember and and sort of call back to often and, and attribute that to her often because it's it's such a really cool and unique like take to remind. Um, and it's I I bring that up mainly because I I'm curious as to the sort of legacy that she's she she's she will have and then will continue to have with the Women's Sports Foundation and with the 50 year anniversary. Can you speak more to like I know you there are research projects that are in the works. But are there other celebrations planned, other ways, uh, other things for youth sport organizations, families, listeners can support or get involved uh, for that? Yeah, so obviously for us, it's um, we're amplifying a lot of the work that we do on a regular basis and kicking everything up a notch. But we do have some, you know, obviously some kind of milestone moments. Last week in D.C. was a big one for us where we really did a significant amount to to obviously raise awareness and everybody across the country celebrates National Girls and Women's Sports Day, which is something that we love, that everybody understands and sees the importance of that. Um, we are doing some, you know, some fun things later in the year. We have one of our, our biggest fundraiser of the year is called the Annual Salute to Women in Sports in October. And that's going to be obviously a celebration and a look back of our 50 years, but also the look forward and the work that we have to do. Um, for all those runners out there, um, a lot of people want to run the New York Marathon, and we're proud to say that we were able to secure 50 bibs. And when you run for a not-for-profit, it ends up helping us fundraise, but also a lot of people who can't get access to the New York Marathon because of how the rules are for runners. It's a great way for people to get engaged with us. But I think you know one of the most important things that I share with people and our work is obviously everybody knows what not for profits do. My job is to fundraise and and generate yeah. you know obviously revenue so that we can do the work that we do. Um, we're very proud of our grant programs. Another one of our grant programs that's cel celebrating a very big anniversary this year is our Sports for Life program, which is in its tenth anniversary. It was co-founded with um, ESPN and Gatorade is a primary partner for that. And that came out of research that started to show that the BIPOC girl community was getting less and less access to sport in different mm. communities. So this grant giving program has been around for 10 years, prioritizes giving grants to girls serving organizations across the country that will help that access point and that youth point for BIPOC girls. And that's mm. something I think is important, obviously, on this call, we're talking about, you know, girls in high school still have a million less participation opportunities mm. than boys. So we've come so far, but where the girls are today is where the boys were um, in 1972. So mm. that's some challenges for us, as is some of the concerns that we have that there are less women coaches coaching women. So we also have very important grant programs around that as well. So what we're really trying to do is shine a big light on our work for 50 years to help people understand who we are, what we are, why we do it, and mm -hmm. to make sure everybody in their own communities are doing and supporting whatever level of women's sports there is. I always tell people that I don't care if you buy a Caitlin Clark jersey. I don't care <laughs> if you buy a ticket to a NWSL game and become a season ticket holder. I want you to go support the girls high school basketball team in your community. It takes everybody to understand the yeah. power of women's sports and to start investing at all levels. We've yeah. always had this traditional metric that we've had to be compared to, but we've never had the ability. It's been this merry-go-round for us for a very long time because we've been judged in a way that we've never had the ability to have the platforms necessary to be able to expose women's sports the way that they are. So now we all have that opportunity and I hope that people will amplify our work, promote us, but at the same time, do the same thing in their communities, become a coach of a youth girl soccer team. It doesn't matter. It's just, this is too important for society right now and too yeah. important, especially with how divisive we are and it's mm -hmm. too important for young girls with everything that's happening between social media and everything else. They need to be physical and they need to get out there and they need to play sports. Yeah, it's yeah. coming. I've, I'm, I'm lining up all the opportunities. I'm getting all of, all of the shorts so I can I can coach girl soccer, and I'm going to try to get her to do flag football. All the things. I just I you know she has no choice but to be surrounded by sports, and whatever she chooses to pick up, I'm going to be just the biggest <laughs> uh, just megaphone behind her it. To everything. That's what yeah. I mean. Exactly. Expose her so she can find her heart and her passion. That's yeah. what I think everybody needs to understand. And then the other thing I will say for all those youth sports parents out there don't live vicariously through your children let mm. your children yeah. form their paths because yeah. there are a lot of positive of youth sports but we also have gone a little too extreme on the pay for, for sure. play model in youth sports and yeah. 
the, you know, the club is the only way it's um, it doesn't matter what level you play sports at. And I think for my experience in elite sports, both collegially and professionally, it's still a very small percentage of girls and boys that ever get to that level and recognize that journey for your child and make sure it's a journey that is healthy and also that they are exposed to a lot of things because it's important to not put all that pressure on them as well. It's playing to play, yeah. not, not focusing on, on the win. It's just playing to play. I love that. Yeah. I think we had a past a guest. I think it was Kirsten Jones. Maybe she, she wrote a book called raising mm -hmm. empowered athletes, but um, I think her quote was like, it's not your thing. Like, this is not your thing. This is your kid's thing. You just are there to, you know, empower them to whatever yeah. their thing is, get them there and, and make sure they're having a good experience with it. So, um, I did want to call back to, you know, obviously we, we made note of, you know, the Sabrina and Steph, the three point shootout. Obviously, if you're not aware of Caitlin Clark, I'm not really sure where you're located, perhaps, uh, <laughs> under a rock at this point. There's this game um, called basketball. Yeah. You dribble a ball. <laughs> Anyways. There are, there are so many things happening in, you know, not only professional women's sports, collegiate, you know, women's sports yeah. is, you know, we've kind of talked about all of those. Um, and then also talking about, you know, I think a lot of people are like, yeah, we should support women's sports. Like, and then they don't, you know, do anything or maybe they'll watch a game and then, you know, you know, Caitlin Clark's going to graduate. Are you still going to watch her when she goes to the WNBA? So like, I like that you called attention to go do things in your community. It's very easy for you. And it's not a big lift to go out and do those things. How do we, or how do you think, you know, the next, let's say 10 years, uh, how do we make sure that we don't lose the momentum of what's happening and ensure like those things are getting down to a grassroots level. Yeah. Those things are actually making an impact. Um, because I do think we're, you know, we've said it like four or five times already, this is kind of an inflection point. And how do we make sure that we're bringing that down to a level where we are improving youth sport participation for females, you know, like we we're doing the work at the grassroots level so that it continues to grow and grow. Um, how do you see that kind of coming to life? Yeah. I, I like to say it's um, there's not one silver bullet for this, right? There's still yeah. a lot of hand to hand combat that has to happen. We still have a lot of issues at all levels for participation for girls. Like we talked about, it's the reason why we have so many different grant programs and so many different mm -hmm. things to make sure girls have access. But when we talk about investment, I think it's really important to understand how the whole ecosystem works, right? And there's some yeah. challenges within the ecosystem. So we start, and obviously today we're talking a lot about the youth side and that access point and making sure that they have their first entry point in. And those levels are really important to invest in whether you're a parent, whether you're a brand, whether you're, and it's it's a really unique opportunity to show the impact you can make at a grassroots level, as well as all the way through the elite part of the ecosystem. Like I always like to remind people, you start with youth and the access point, and that can be everything from obviously, as we know, from playing at, at a club level to playing at your school. And then you have also the collegiate kind of middle ecosystem, which a lot of women have benefited in order to be able to go to school and earn a scholarship, which again is a very elite level when you're playing at the college level. It doesn't matter what division you are. You got to be really good to play at that level. And then you go into without that college level because we don't have another training or feeding system to the elite model in most sports. Yeah. It may not be tennis and golf and some sports. But when it comes to Team USA and our success in the summer games in particular, it ties back to all of this ecosystem. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I like to remind people that in the Women's World Cup this past year, mm -hmm. only 10 co countries rosters did not have a athlete that benefited from Title IX on their roster either going to high school in the United States or going to college in the United States. So that's another thing about our whole ecosystem that has really transformed not just the United States, but also kind of the global impact we've made. And then you go into without that and without this whole system, there really is no WNBA, there is no NWSL, yeah. and there isn't that next level. Where we are now is people and brands and you know even private equity and everything else is starting to see the power of all of the different kind of periphery parts mm -hmm. of sports, which if you're in the sports industry, you understand from yeah. media rights and exposure, merchandising, um, investing in owning teams. But it, yeah. we need that all across the whole system. But we have to also make sure if there's threats 
So there's a lot of threats to the college model right now with what's out there, unfortunately. We need yeah. to make sure there's things that are protected and there's always the focus on that access point because if kids and girls don't have that access point to start, you're never yeah. going to be able to go on this journey. And then if you're somebody like me that ends up being a middle school dropout, or even if your last days of playing or college or your last day of playing or high school, what's happening now is because my generation is the first generation to have lived with this, men and women, you're now seeing the decision makers at brands and you know people who have you know maybe more means they're making those investments because they have lived with this for 50 yeah. years that's why yeah. i think the steph sabrina story is so important for this one reason it is about mutual respect by elite mm -hmm. athletes mm -hmm. steph and sabrina both know what it takes to be at that level it does not matter if you are a man or a woman and sabrina yeah. said it best if you can shoot you can mm -hmm. shoot that whole elite side and the fact that male athletes are wearing Sabrina shoes, I can tell you this wasn't that long ago. I could never find even women's basketball shoes for my mm -hmm. daughter because they didn't exist coming from female athletes even less than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So where we are is this whole momentum across the entire ecosystem, but everybody has a role to play. If investment yeah. doesn't keep happening at all those levels, and protection doesn't happen to make sure that we can give this access point, whatever those challenges are that some girls face, then it breaks. And that's why I want to make sure people pay attention to how the whole thing's connected together. And I know we're all proud of where we're, where we are, but we are nowhere where we need to be. Like that's, right. that's the reality. Like we are so far from where we need to be. We are still very crumbs based when it's saying the type of money that's invested in women's sports. We still are. It's like, I kind of giggle sometimes. I love this momentum, but I try to say, hey, welcome to the party of women's sports. It's been yeah. <laughs> a really long time. Yeah, we've um, been here. It's, yeah. There's just so much opportunity, and that's what I'm excited about, but people can't take it for granted either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, you know, we're not we're not there, right? Like, you see all like, the excitement, and, yeah. and I think a lot of people are maybe like, oh, like, look, we did it. Like, you know, look how great this all is. And it's like, you know, no, there's so much more that can be done and, and, and so much further to go. Yeah, I don't mean to be the 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 quote geek, but I'm going to do it again with uh, Kobe Bryant, girl dad, when he says job's not done. And just that's the mentality, right? It's just it, it, like great, awesome, cool. Job's not done. Now now we keep moving, keep moving forward. Yeah, I want to double down on the the Steph Sabrina. Uh, yeah. You know, obviously that was so cool to watch and like just see the excitement. And obviously there was also, as with anything on social, negative people coming in and saying certain things about it, which, you know, just more attention, which I think is a good thing. Uh, that's how I'm going to choose to look at it. Uh, but you made note that, you know, it's interesting to look back on, you know, Billy Jean and the battle of the sexes and kind of seeing the similarities between the two. Do you want to maybe talk about, about that and, and kind of what you saw and, and how cool it was to like, now we're, you know, in this day and age and, and something similar is happening and what that could mean for the next, I don't know, 30 years or whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if any of you had a chance to watch the rebroadcast last year at the battle of the sexes. I did. And it was honestly the first time I think I had seen it in kind of obviously where I am now in my life yeah. and like watch the whole broadcast. So first of all, I was completely shocked being reminded of like, I couldn't even believe how the broadcast worked and how they were talking about it, right? I'm like, holy cow, this is happening? And I realized, okay, that was a long time ago, but still yeah. like, as a female, it was a little embarrassing to see how the whole thing was kind of positioned. Mm -hmm. um, but here's what I think. And obviously I wasn't, you know, in the few conversations I've had with Billie Jean and kind of watching like her experience of the battle of the sexes, um, I think Billie Jean understood that it was so much bigger than sport. And I think when you watch that broadcast, you're reminded this was a movement for women. And like Billie always reminds me, she's like, Danette, I couldn't get a credit card in my own name at this point <laughs> in my life. Yeah. I couldn't do this, this and this. Like there were so many things that women couldn't do 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that moment in time was she knew she had to win. And that was what I liked about the Sabrina and Steph moment. Sabrina didn't have to win. I mean, Sabrina mm -hmm. proved last year when she hit the number that she hit. And yeah. then the fact that she ends up matching what all the top one in the three-point shooting was, she was going mm -hmm. up against, like, Steph and Sabrina are ridiculously elite yeah. shooters. Like, if you've mm -hmm. ever watched the games, like, I watched Sabrina play when she was at Oregon because she's actually from the Bay Area. Yeah. And I've been watching Sabrina shoot the lights out forever. And so it's – you knew she had this talent. And for me, it was that kind of interesting yeah. – difference between what Billy had to do 
and what that kind of moment in time referenced. And I think what you were referencing just about the shoes and the fact that male athletes want to wear a female yeah. athlete's shoe, like everything with Sabrina and Steph was about mutual respect. And it wasn't yeah. just mutual respect between Sabrina and Steph. It was also all the other NBA athletes commenting how they, you know, I'm back in Sabrina. And that didn't happen 10 years ago. Like people don't realize that. That did not exist 10 years ago. And we're yeah. just at a different moment. And, you know, I like to remind people that sometimes now with these elite athletes, it's the mom and their family that was the elite athlete. Mm -hmm. And that's also what never the case, that yeah. Sabrina have grown up with is, it's been men and women that have been really strong athletes for the last 50 years. And they've, they've experienced that, you know, from a, you know, by having it their whole lives. And that's, what's great about that legislation, yeah. but that's what people just don't connect the dots on. And, and I sit there and scratch my head and said, this isn't a coincidence people. <laughs> it shouldn't just sprout up out of nowhere. Yeah. This I, I'm, I'm curious to, I wanted to know about your own experience as being, a parent sort of on the sidelines. And, and I want to ask if, uh, you know, Olivia plays sports uh, and, and maybe lessons you've learned over the, over the years of, of being a, a U sport, uh, a parent, yourself. mom, a U sport yes. mom, U sport mom. Yes. Um, so my daughter had no chance besides being thrown into every sport. Cause obviously that was <laughs> my, that was my thing. Um, also if you have any tips of like, like introducing them to sports too, like, I'm not, don't worry about me. I'm just taking notes. You're, you're good. Go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, I wanted to introduce her to as many things as possible. I introduced her to everything from ballet to dance to, yeah. I wanted her to find her, whatever that was going to be. I knew how important sports were from uh, any type of that kind of team building opportunity, but your kids, you know, every kid is different. I only have one child, so it's hard for me to make comparisons to those that have, you know, more than one child, but my daughter started playing everything. And then she kind of found her heart and her youth in soccer and basketball. And so we started playing soccer and basketball. And that ended up being like, I was that mom, like every other mom driving to practice, going to tournaments, Yep. And, you know, I can tell you to this day, her best friend in life is one of her teammates from her club soccer days. And one is at Boise State and my daughter's at University of Wisconsin. And I know they're getting together for spring break this year. So it's and, you know, and her best friend plays lacrosse at Boise State. So it's um, something that has been a big part of her life. And then yeah. as she progressed throughout the youth movement, I definitely saw the challenge as a parent of specialization. I chose as a parent not to let Olivia specialize. I wanted her mm -hmm. to play basketball, play yeah. soccer, find her way, um, and and then find something in high school too. So when she started high school, she decided to run cross country, mainly because she wanted to train for potentially making the high school soccer team. And where we, leave, where we live and where a lot of places are, it's very competitive. So she ended up not making her high school soccer team. Oh, and that was mm -hmm. very devastating for her. Um, and that was kind of an, also an eye-opening experience for me as a mom. I'm like, did I do something wrong? Cause I didn't let my kids specialize and only play one sport. Yeah. And, but then I realized, oh my God, this is all about resiliency. And it's, it's at the end of the day, it's, it's yep. going to be just fine. So she ended up running cross country and track in high school and played soccer outside and kind of gave up her basketball hoops for probably a lot of reasons. She's about five, three. So she probably, didn't have that <laughs> maybe that might've been one. <laughs> Might have been maybe the better route to go. She um, needed to be a really good shooter, and that just wasn't her strength. But I think if she looks back at sport now, she looks at it the same way that I do. Like, yeah. she definitely did yeah. not like some sports. And she reminds that of me, right? Reminds that to me all the time. <laughs> um, she's like, I really did not like. It's like for her, she's like, Mom, you threw me into swim team, and that was not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really feeling like you, your daughter, and I are almost like the same. I was going to say, I'm like, <laughs> just like, <laughs> you cannot swim. <laughs> Soccer and basketball. I ran cross country just because of soccer, and I'm a huge Badger fan. So I mean, oh, is right, this, right there. Is this me? Like I don't know. I'm feeling well, like we're go. kindred souls a little bit. It's it's funny, but yeah. So I would say I went through those same struggles as a mom, and I was working yeah. in collegiate athletics at that time. I was working with yeah. like you know some of the top universities in women's sports. So it was like I was around all that like ridiculous, you yeah. know, ridiculousness of elite athletes that were so good. And so many of the Olympians came out of those schools. So it was an interesting time to watch my child go through that, her youth journey, and then to see the whole, everybody trying to get a college scholarship. That yeah. was also something I saw too. So it was fascinating. Yeah. It's something that we've heard a lot, uh, you know, of, of this, this importance or this being like their first question. Like I'm thinking back to Joe Cummings, who was uh, this amazing uh, soccer coach. 
and, and it's just like, are they good enough for a D1 scholarship before like anything else or like saying, hi, my name is Joe, by the way, like just that's their first question. And, and that being the importance. And if that's the focus and that's the goal, that's not, then it's not, you're not keeping the main thing, the main thing, the main thing is play. The main thing is having the experience itself. I'm curious just to, I guess, from your experience as a, as a youth sport parent too, I know there's probably tons of lessons. If you can distill it down to one, to potential parents who are going to be starting to introduce sports to their kids, um, or for somebody who's maybe on their way to a practice right now, what's one solid lesson of looking back going, I, I would love it if somebody had just kind of said or reminded me about X, what would that be? You know, I do think coaches matter. Um, I think it's very mm-hmm. important to be paying attention to um, the types of coaches they have. Um, and my hope, you know, I, I'll give a shout out to organizations like Positive Coaching Alliance. I've had a chance to get to know their CEO, um, mm-hmm. you know, over the last two years. It's yeah. really important that you have a good coaching experience. They play a big role and they're very influential in your child. And you don't want it to go the negative route that sometimes you can see where you sports go. Again, I, I use very broadly, don't live vicariously through your children. And, you know, I think for me, after spending so many times with like division one coaches and it didn't matter what sport, I think that level, they understand like, if your child is that good, they're going to be that good. Like, and they're, I think the best, 